So welcome to Steelcast, an unusual one this time. We're at UK Metals Expo 2024. I'm Tim Rutter, I'm host of Steelcast, and today we're going to be talking at all things Metals Expo. So we've come to the end of the show, so it's been two days, it's been manic, it's been busy in the seminar rooms. This is the biggest used theatre we're sat in today. I'm with Gareth and I'm with Abby, uh, and we spent two days going around talking to people about all the topics we can think about that are relevant to decarbonising the UK steel industry, uh, and frankly we're fairly exhausted. So we thought before we get into looking at those uh, interviews and sharing those with you on the podcast, we just share our own thoughts about the show really and, uh, and see how it's gone. Abby, what's your favourite bit's been? It's hard to pick really, Tim. I think, to be honest, the best bit about it has been just the general buzz. There's definitely been an excitement, I think, this year, just surrounding, I think, all of the panel discussions, really. For example, well, I can't even think of one in particular, but there just seems to be people flooding out of each theatre, and I don't think that was the case when we came here the first year. Yeah. It was like less than half the size. Yeah, it's difficult to think back, isn't it? So you and I came two years ago. Yeah. Gareth, you came on your own last year, didn't you? Because we were away for whatever reason. And uh, how's it different from last year? Because yeah, so, so yeah, last year I was on my own. Um, and that was, that was big. Uh, that was frantic. That was fun. And this year it's just double everything. The, yeah. the room's twice the size. There's twice as many stands. There's literally hundreds of people. The, the, the th- I'd say the theatres are the same size this year, but they have been absolutely rammed. Right? People not only filling the seats, but all around the outside. Yeah, yeah. And like, yeah, the topics sort of did feel, certainly day one, felt everything just felt relevant to us. It's like, yeah. you know, the, the transition from uh, blast furnace to electric arc. Um, we've covered things like C BAM, we've had scrap. Um, I interviewed someone about the, the social implications of, of such a transition. Um, it's just, it's just, it's been like, so much good content to grab and I think we've covered it all. Yeah, I, I can't help but remember as we were walking across the car park on that first day and you said a few years ago I would never have imagined I would have been getting excited about a metals exposition. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly that and then like, yeah, because I've been looking forward to this for weeks. I, I saw, <laughs> I've seen the lineup, up, the panels, and stuff. not only the topics but the people on them as yeah. well. You've got Ben Burgrass, Pete Quinns, uh, Dave Worsley, we've got some, so many great speakers here, it's an, an amazing event and I just cannot wait for next year. Yeah, we were lucky when we to grab Lord Reedsdale and we've had some people from Swansea University, some Tata Steel people as well, I mean we've tried to focus on talking to people from outside the organisation. Any one particular stand out, Abby, people you talk to? Particular, um, well you've already mentioned him really, Dave Worsley is yeah, fantastic, legend. he was he was fantastic to talk to, um, I chatted to Frank Askoff as well from UK Steel. Um, yeah then, that was quite a challenge because that's a complex detailed topic yeah. and fair play to him, he made it pretty, sound pretty you know, straightforward and he explained it really well didn't he? Well I understood it so you know it, yeah. he was obviously successful in telling yeah. the story because you're right it is a really complicated topic. Yeah, yeah no it's been excellent I think uh, I'm shattered I can't remember how many interviews we've done but it's in the it's in the double figures I think for me I think my favorite bit I mean I've been in the steel industry all my life so 35 years and I just think the sense of family I'm not sure there's many industries left in in the UK where there's this sense of family in every corner you turn you bump into people either you work with but they're in different locations or people you worked with in years gone by who now work for different organizations or trade organizations and everyone's really pleased to see each other and you know I can say that for 35 years and you guys have been here much less but do you get that same sense of belonging, Absolutely. that sense of family yeah. from the from yeah. the industry? Yeah, yeah. So you know, obviously I've been around all of our UK sites, and everyone seems to, to flock to these events, and uh, it's great. You know, you get a handshake and a hug from everybody, and yeah. it is definitely that that sense of extended family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and Abby, I guess this year was interesting, and and Gareth too. I come back because this year. Uh, on the first day of the show, of course, the UK government announced they're signing the £500 million commitment to Tata Steel. What impact do you think that had on people at the show? Did you get any sense of excitement about that? Oh, definitely. Well, we just saw, you know, when Rajesh had his Q&A with Lord Reevesdale at the start of the day, you've already said this, Gareth, but people were literally flooded in out of the theatre. Yeah. I think people were anticipating that some news was coming. Yeah. Um, and yeah, they just wanted to hear it straight from the horse's mouth if that's an okay yeah. way of putting yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, last year, Gareth, only a few days after the show you were here, Yeah. It was announced for the first time, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, I don't know what it is about the Metals Expo, <laughs> but it just seems to coincide with government announcement. So literally the very next day, we had Kenny Bard not come to the Talbot site, yeah. um, talking about the £500 million investment. 
it's, it's, it's been announced during the Metals Expo this time around. Yeah. Um, and yeah, everyone just yeah, everyone just seems to want to know what our Tata Steel doing at the moment. Yeah. It seems like the whole country, if not the whole world, is looking at us at the moment yeah. in the in this transition. It feels overwhelmingly positive as well, don't they? You know, it's like yeah. now you've got the money, now you can step forward, and now you yeah. can invest. And uh, I know Gareth, you did lots of the interviews last year. You did all the interviews last year. You were here on your own. God yeah. knows how you did it. And that's on one of the previous podcasts. Abby, first time doing this sort of running around chasing people down and and doorstepping them. How have you found it? Um, yeah, again, exciting. I've used that word a few times. It has been overwhelming, I won't lie. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's an intense event, but in the best possible way. And I think, you know, once you've got getting lost out of the way for the first day, yeah. <laughs> you come back on the second day, you, you know your surroundings a bit better. Um, and it's been nice to meet, meet some women in industry as well. Yeah, sure. So I've, I've spoken to Kirsty Davis Chinnock, um, some ladies from Women in Recycling, and it's been nice to get some links there because obviously we've got the Women of Steel podcast too. And yeah. I feel like I'm building my own little community now, you know? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I guess one of the downsides, Gareth, is we've been running around trying to interview people so that we can share the yeah. highlights of yeah. the story through the podcast. The downside is we've not actually been able to sit through many seminars, have That's we? It. it is. It's a frustrating, like I said to you before, it's frustrating that we actually have to work this event <laughs> because I would love just to sit in so many seminars. And even if we weren't working, there are so many good seminars going on at the same time. Yeah. So you really have to pick and choose your, what you want to listen into. Yeah. Um, we have tried to capture as many seminars as we can for our, for our internal yeah. audience as well, which would yeah. be great to share with them. Um, but yeah, whoever put the, the, this event together, well done to them. Yeah, fair play to it. I absolutely totally agree with that. And to Lord Reedsdale, all the UK Metals Exo team, everyone has had a part to play. It's been fantastic. And, uh, you know, inevitably we've talked about steel, we've talked about decarbonising steel rather than all the other metals that are being promoted here. But uh, listen, without further ado, let's get uh, into some of those interviews we've had over the last two days, hear what people had to say. And I uh, hope, hope you get something out of this. Hope you enjoy listening to these uh, interviews. And thanks to all those people who put their head above the parapet and took part. So today we've come to the NEC in Birmingham to the third UK Metals Expo. It's just launched, it's just about 10 o'clock in the morning. Managed to grab uh, Lord Reedsdale, who's opened the show today. Lord Reedsdale, it's a bigger show than it's been before, isn't it? It's, it's amazing how quickly it's grown. But I, I always find it um, surprising people don't realise how big the sector is and how it affects so many people around, the, uh, around all elements of the com country. We do have a manufacturing sh uh, sector and we need to celebrate it. Yeah, and uh, it is a lot bigger and it's grown almost exponentially, hasn't it? You must be delighted with the success it must have had to generate so much attraction this year. I, I, the team have worked really hard on it, but it's a business-to-business -business show and you're getting people saying, well, you have to turn up to meet your clients, meet everybody else, and it's, sort of, and it's nice to build a community. Yeah, and Chris McDonald opening the show there with a keynote speech about industrial strategy. What part do metals have to play in the UK industrial strategy? It's incredibly important, but it's not just the big... Um, you know, it's not just the big Tartars, it's not the big British Steel. It's amazing, you go anywhere in the country and you go down, you know, onto the industrial strait and there's companies producing incredible, um, you know, metal products. And we just don't see it, but it's there. And that's what we, I think in Parliament, we really need to um, start thinking much more about um, promoting that element of the economy. Yeah, and we've got two very full days. There's seminars all over the place at this show, aren't there? There's exhibitors around. A lot of key topics. What are the big topics you're, you're really looking forward to hearing about this next two days? I think there's industrial stretch is a big one. It's looking forward to the new government, how they're going to invest. But it's also looking at the circular economy and carbon. We need to understand that actually it's a good news story in this country. You know, we can actually, we're now looking at the possibility of electric arc furnaces reprocessing all the steel, which at the moment we're sending abroad. Yeah. We really need to start thinking about our security in metal. And, you know, the problems with Brexit is we now have to look at a localised supply chain. Globalisation's going the other way. Mm. Yeah. And, of course, there's some difficult things going on in the industry at the moment. Ourselves, Tata Steel, are going through a big restructure. British Steel are looking through a, a big restructure. What are you, how are you feeling about the industry going forward? Are you worried about it or are you full of positivity? I think, uh, I think the announcement coming forward showed that the government really and you know really see that Tata and British Steel are important 
But, you know, the problem with it is we've got ageing infrastructure that hasn't had the investment. And, you know, you can't rely on that to have forever. Yeah. And, you know, it's devastating to see that there's going to be a large number of job losses. But you're looking at the future. And, of course, the job losses are going to be, I think, offset by the number of other industries that build up around it using the new products. Yeah, we certainly hope so. Listen, thanks very much for taking a few minutes out. You must be the busiest man in the show, I think, this week. I'm sure we'll catch up with you later. Uh, but for the time being, thanks very much. Great to see you and good luck with the show. Thank you. OK, so we've just heard the opening address there. Lord Reedsdale opened it. Chris McDonald was a keynote speaker and managed to grab Chris quickly after his speech this morning. Chris, great to see you again. I think the last time I saw you was outside the Houses of Parliament before you became an MP. So firstly, congratulations for your appointment and your election as an MP. Great keynote speech this morning to set the show off. It's quite a big show now, isn't it? It is good to see you as well, Tim. And you're right. We were last time we met was the Save Our Steel campaign uh, outside Parliament, um, and now, of course, I'm inside Parliament trying to do exactly that. Um, and th this show, I think, is a real example of how successful the UK metals industry is. It's the third time it's run. It's probably twice the size that it was uh, mm -hmm. on that, that first occasion. And I've had the real privilege this year of, of opening the show um, and in my new role as well. And I spent, took that opportunity to talk to the people here about the importance of industrial strategy and the difference it could make for our industry. Yeah, yeah, and industrial strategy on everybody's lips. I'm sure whoever is here is part of the supply chain, none less than Tata Steel and British Steel, and we're sharing the hospitality area it's massive massive topic industrial strategy and it can't be done without government now you're within it what are your ambitions as a Labour government for the industrial strategy for the UK well my key message to the industry here is that the industrial strategy is vital it's vital for our country and it's but it's also vulnerable um, so it's vital for the communities as well that we serve you know whether it's South Wales or the North East where I'm based and um, those communities know that a manufacturing or an industrial job it pays better it provides a really strong sense of community cohesion but we need it for our defence and for foreign policy too but industrial strategy is also vulnerable it's the first time we've had a proper industrial strategy in this country for 40 years and if we don't get this right we won't see it again for a generation so I'm calling on everyone in the industry to help me to help the government to have a really good industrial strategy. Yeah, because lots of people of a certain generation will be very big fans of a country that makes things my parents certainly would have been. Some years ago, George Osborne lauded the March of the Makers and it never really got off the ground, did it? And um, it's hugely complex, hugely complex supply chains. You've got Brexit now where we're sitting as an independent island. Lots of steel workers will have voted Brexit thinking that that would enable a UK government to intervene more with industries such as Thailand to steel. Is that part of a strategy, more government intervention, do you think? Well, I think continued intervention isn't in and of itself a strategy. Um, so I think all countries around the world generally do recognise the importance of industry and manufacturing as the foundation for a stable economy, a wealth generating economy. And, and what usually goes alongside that then is a really positive strategy to attract investment and, and enable those businesses to be successful. So it's slightly more longer term thinking than just an investment. And you're right, it's incredibly popular policy for, the, for all the right reasons. Yeah, because it adds to productivity amongst everything else, one of the diseases of the country. Now, Chris, I know you're a busy man, there's lots going on. There are lots of seminars today, there's lots of exhibitors here today, lots of big, big topics being discussed. What is it you're particularly looking forward to? Well, I'm encouraging everyone to get along to the Back British Metals session, which is on this afternoon. That's a campaign the industry's launched to attract investment. I've won the support of the government for that campaign as well, so massive opportunity for the UK metal sector. So get along there, find out about that campaign, support it, and we'll see if we can get some government help to get investment in the metal sector. Yeah, listen, fantastic to see you again, Chris. All the very best of luck for your time in Parliament. Uh, power to your elbow and influencing industrial strategy. I'm sure everyone's behind you uh, because we realise how important it is for, for society and communities. That uh, Have a great show. Thanks again for your time, and I'm sure we'll catch you again soon. Cheers. Thank you, Tim. We are well underway on morning one of the Metals Expo. Um, we've had an opening from Chris McDonald and I'm catch up with Chief Executive of Tata Steel UK, Rajesh Nair. Now Rajesh, you've just come off a panel yourself, a uh, view from the top. Uh, what, what, what went on in that panel? Well, it was about uh, telling everybody here or about our transformation, about uh, transforming the Tata Steel UK business, transforming the Tata Steel steel business to a sustainable, viable business uh, of the future. It was about 
letting them all know how what we are doing and how we are embarking on this transformation. Yeah, yeah. And it was a very successful session, very uh, very popular session. I think it was close to 200 people squeezed into the, the venue and around the sides there. A lot of audience uh, interaction there. One, one, of the, one of the questions that came up was our interest or the potential use of, of hydrogen uh, for Tata Steel, maybe Tata Steel UK. Uh, what, what, what was your answer to that question? Well, hydrogen is one of the potential solutions to decarbonizing the steel industry and it has great potential, but uh, it still has to uh, demonstrate that potential at scale as far as the steel industry is concerned. And there's a lot of work going on and hopefully we will get there. But as far as we are concerned in Tata Steel UK, our chosen path for decarbonizing our steel business, decarbonizing the industry, is through the scrap-based route. And therefore, our technological option that we have chosen is, a, is building an electric arc furnace, which will then melt the, uh, the huge amount of scrap that's available and potentially available for the future in the UK to convert it into steel of high quality. And for us, therefore, the value for hydrogen as, as a primary decarbonization solution is limited. However, we continue to follow the developments in hydrogen, both globally and in the UK, because hydrogen does have the potential to replace uh, other sources of energy in areas like combustion, reheating, etc. And uh, if we have the right, uh, uh, right options, uh, we would like to then uh, use hydrogen for these purposes, which can then help us to reduce our uh, CO2 footprint uh, in the areas where we are uh, using this and the other forms of energy. Yeah. Of course, energy is a, a massive topic for us. It's an energy-intensive industry, especially as we move towards the electric arc furnace. Uh, maybe someone who could answer those questions would be someone like um, Chris McDonald, MP, uh, who opened the session. Now, he also touched upon um, a sort of strategy for the UK, an industrial strategy. Where do you think we are with that? Well, I'm not eminently equipped to answer that question, but I think what is important is, at least since the time I have been uh, here in the UK, which is close to about three years, there is more and more talk about an industrial strategy. There are more and more people who are wanting to put their voice and their might behind the idea of an industrial strategy or the lack of an industrial strategy in the UK. And the belief that uh, uh, a good sound industrial strategy which gives the fillip to manufacturing, which brings in investment, etc., is has to be one of the options for the UK to, to to further expand its economy, to 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 start to you know accelerate the economic growth in the uh, in the country, and uh, and as we heard from Chris uh, this morning, uh, there's a keenness to to work an industrial strategy, uh, which will then hopefully uh, get investment in, and once you get investment in, uh, we will we will see the benefit of that investment flowing through through the economy. Yeah, yeah. So there'll be investment into the company, into the industry, that'll benefit our communities. Yeah. Um, what you may have not been aware of is that we, we live streamed your session just now uh, on LinkedIn and we had some nice engagement there. I saw a comment that said, uh, it looks as though we are leading the way. Do you think that the tide is starting to turn people's opinion of our transition from blast furnace steel making to electric arc furnace steel making? Uh, do you think people are starting to see the green benefits and the benefits it can bring? Yes, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to, to see these kind of comments. I'm not sure whether the tide is turning, but surely I think people are getting to understand the larger purpose of, of, of the transformation that we are looking to undertake here in the, in the UK. And in, in a small way, I'm also hoping that this will be the catalyst along with the potential industrial strategy that the government and the policymakers are talking about for a revitalization of uh, manufacturing and industry in general, which has been uh, in the decline in the UK for several years. And uh, it is now generally felt that a revitalization of industry and manufacturing is essential for the next growth. And in some ways, yes, if not leading the way, 
I would like to believe that this transformation, and I think this transformation, would be a catalyst to it. And uh, that's our hope, that's my hope. And uh, hopefully we can do it uh, sooner than later. Yeah, perfect, leading our way to that, that our green steel future there. Um, thank you so much for your time. I know you're very busy. People who want to talk to you, you're headed back to the networking area now. Uh, thanks again, Rajesh. Uh, we'll see if we can catch up with next. Thank you. Thank you, Gareth. So here we are at UK Metals Expo in the NEC in Birmingham and it is a gathering of the great and the good of the UK metals industry and as we wander around we're trying to catch as many people as we can to talk to them about the future of the steel industry and all of the topics that are so relevant today in 2024. Now I've come across an old mucker of ours from Tata Steel, Martin Bronick. Now Martin, I um, understand you've just been made chair of UK Steel. Nice big job for you at the, at the moment. Uh, Events like this are really important for our industry, aren't they? Why, why is that? Well, it brings people together. Events like Metals Expo brings people with a common interest together who want an industrial strategy. Um, as chair of UK Steel, my job is to work with the, you know, the CEOs of the steel companies and look at what are the policy asks for government. You know, the policy asks could be on energy, for example. Previous, previous government did a lot about energy, but our costs are still 50% higher than Germany or France. So one of our asks would be, can we have a competitive landscape, please, would be an ask of our policy changes, for example. Yeah, and there must be few occasions in the year when all the members of UK Steel and the wider supply chain come together in one place. There are a lot of Tata Steel people here, I know. There'll be a lot of others. It must be a great networking opportunity for people. Metals Expo is a fantastic networking opportunity for people. It was my first time here. It's the third, third Metals Expo. But the people I've met who I've re-engaged with, whether they be customers, you know, CEOs of steel companies or ex-colleagues or form, you know, current colleagues. It's there's a real buzz about this place. You just feel it. Yeah, yeah. Now, UK Steel arguably is a, uh, a trade organization, a lobbying organization with the government. Now, that lobbying is on behalf of, I think, is eight of the big steel companies in the UK. You're a Tata Steel employee. How do you balance those uh, maybe conflicting interests sometimes? Yeah, occasionally there can be conflicting interests. But what we try and do is say, what are our common policy asks? So, for example, Tata Steel UK will pull together its policy ask uh, of government. Um, UK Steel will also do the same on behalf of the steel companies. Lar largely, there's a common um, degree of similarity in the documents. Yeah. So, UK Steel at the moment are rewriting their steel manifesto um, following the election. Yeah. So, it's not written what we want the opposition to do, it's like what we want government to do. And what we'll do, we'll get, we get together every, every three months um, as, a, as a UK Steel council, if you like. And we plan events. So, for example, one of the plan events we're planning is steel procurement in public buildings. Yeah. And one of the lobbying asks we will be saying to government and their partners, you know, 40% of the steel today um, for public procurement is from British steel companies in the UK. Yeah. Um, why isn't it 80%? Yeah, yeah. Um, so th th those are some of the challenges that we'll bring, bring forward to government and say, come on, you can do this. Yeah. And it is interesting, isn't it? Because I think a lot of people may look at our industry and say, listen, guys, you've got your funding for your electric arc furnace. The job's over with the government, isn't it? But clearly there's a lot more to do. We've got a new Labour government. You know, how positive are you about the relationship between the steel industry and this new government has got five years in powers to develop an industrial strategy? Yeah, so the, the, ourselves in Tata Steel, but the, the, the steel companies in the UK have an excellent uh, relationship with the Labour government, formed you know, for years in, in opposition, but particularly the current administration, Nikia Starmer mm. and Johnny Reynolds as business secretary. Um, you know, we've built up those relationships over the last two or three years. So going forward, you know, we know each other, they know our asks, um, and we expect them to work with us, um, whether it be on capital, so they've got another two and a half billion pounds to spend on investment to create growth, to create wealth, or whether it be on policy asks such as energy, such as CBAM, yeah. tariffs or scrap, for example. Yeah, listen, great that you've got the job. Many congratulations and uh, well deserved. I'm sure you'll be a fantastic uh, independent chair of UK Steel and, uh, and you'll be putting forward all of the policy asks of the steel industry and the, metal, the wider metals industry to government and uh, I wish you every luck in your venture Martin, good to see you here. Thanks Tim. So here we are, it's the afternoon of the UK Metals Expo, I'm with John Bolton. John um, is the chairman of the Materials Processing Institute. Uh, he's just sat on uh, a panel um, asking how can the UK metals industry uh, decarbonise and reach net zero? Now, John, welcome to Steelcast. And what, what came up in that panel discussion? 
So um, lots of things. I think the, the introduction actually set a really good scene as the things that we need for decarbonisation. You know, we need the skills, we need the technology, um, we need investment importantly and there needs to be a strong market and we covered all of those items um, really and I think the answer is and I, I presented it as an investment strategy almost in that we have a strong market you know there's about 11 million ton market for steel end of mill steel products in the UK traditionally we've only um, produced about four of that so there is a market there is we do have the skills we actually have I think I didn't really appreciate until I left corporate life how much of a strong network we have of innovation technology catapults and and academics who are, who could be actually leveraged to improve the business plan for investment um, and we have people we have people who are you know that are that are experienced in this in this in this industry and the most important importantly recently um, has been the announcement of investment so two and a half billion that's on top of the half a billion that's been announced for Tata um, to to rebuild the UK steel industry so there's a real opportunity here yeah but there's a lot of people that say that uh, decarbonisation that just means deindustrialization now what would what would you say to those people I think there is a real risk, I'll be, I'll be honest, and I think if you look at the way it's happening in the UK, the visual of that is, well, that's exactly what's happening. We're, we're shutting down blast furnaces and, we're, and then we're going to spend a fortune on bringing it, which, which is quite rightly, to put electric art furnaces in place. And other countries haven't quite done it that way, but it's not. You know, I think this is quite a brave and a, a massive project um, that, that the steel industry in the UK is undertaking, but it will result in a lower carbon, a decarbonised steel sector. Yeah, and you, and you did mention on the on the panel discussion that you know once we decarbonise, you know, our companies that have decarbonised, they will become profitable. Is that, is that is that what you believe? Well, I think I mean there's lots there's lots of that go into making a company profitable, but I think the it is true that actually if you move from a, a blast furnace technology to uh, EAF technology, then uh, decarbonisation actually does give you the opportunity to become more competitive. It is generally lower cost um, to to do that and you will at least initially get a green premium you will be supplying the market with green steel now lots of people are doing that so speed is of the essence because i don't think that premium will last forever but it is there and so i think and we've been saying it for ages that actually if the electricity price is competitive in the uk which is a big if and it and that's something that needs to happen then electric arc first furnace steel making allows the business to be more to be more competitive and potentially more profitable yeah, and obviously, as Tata Steel UK, we are leading the way in the UK steel industry towards this decarbonisation journey. So I do feel like we are ahead here. But what about globally? Would you say the UK is behind? I would say we're behind. Um, unfortunately, we're making the right steps now. But if you look at electric car furnaces have been placed in place in the USA for 40 years, and if you look at recent announcements in France and Germany of state support for ThyssenKrupp and for ArcelorMittal, I mean they. There are, there are countries that are ahead of us and then outside of Europe in Scandinavia investments are taking place in green steel significant plants are being built with green steel that will produce green steel um, in the Middle East activities uh, uh, there are big developments taking place there so if the world is moving in this direction quite rightly to decarbonize um, and in terms of ensuring this is done in a profitable way speed is of the essence. No, no John uh, in a previous job you were with uh, British Steel for many, many years and you have experience with both blast furnaces and electric arc furnaces. Now, one of the key things that keeps coming up with uh, the differences between the two steel making technologies is the, the grades that can be made with an electric arc furnace. Now, at the moment we're saying we can make about 90% of the grades of steel, um, but we're three years away from um, opening our electric arc furnace. Do you believe as the world moves forward to electric arc steel making, that that will become you know almost 100 percent i do i mean theoretically now technically speaking you can make anything on an electric art phone it's, it's what you put in that's important and so the scrap processing technologies need to have developed and they are developing so there's a significant amount of effort going into scrap management and scrap processing and then you can use scrap substitutes as well so if you look at the strategies in other countries dri is, is being developed so DRI obviously is a scrap substitute it's purer and can actually be used instead of scrap um, and potentially if you go have DRI available you have the right scrap processing available then there is no reason why you can't make all products through an electric art furnace route. 
Fantastic. Thanks, John. Now the theatre's filling up for the next session. I believe Paul Wheeler uh, will be speaking about the transition from blast furnace steel making to electric arc furnace steel making. So we're going to listen in and bring you some more later on. So here we are, the afternoon of the first day of UK Metals Expo. We've just had another session in the Big Issues Theatre, all about changing from a blast furnace to electric arc furnace. On that panel, long-time friend of Tata Steel, long-time champion of the UK steel industry is Gareth Stace. Gareth, you're Director General of UK Steel. Before we go on to some of the stuff you were talking about in the session today, we've just had the announcement. Johnny Reynolds just stood up in the Houses of Parliament today and announced that the new Labour government have signed the grant funding agreement for the £500 million collaboration funding of the electric arc furnace for Tata Steel. Massive moment for the UK steel industry, isn't it? monumentous day for the steel sector. I hope that we'll look back in years to come and see this as the turning point from a sector that year on year would lose more market share, would be producing less steel, would see more imports coming into the UK. As a sector, I hope today marks a change in that where we've seen the biggest investment in our sector in decades and decades um, with a government that firmly understands the issues facing our sector and as we said, you know, today has taken decisive action to invest directly into our steel sector, with also its firm commitments within the National Wealth Fund to invest a further £2.5 billion into our sector over the next few years. Uh, and that can be, only be a good thing for our sector that we then can turn around and see a brighter future for the steel sector in the UK. That's what I want to see. Yeah, and it is a momentous day, as you say, and a lot of people may be listening and watching this saying, I thought that deal would be done a year ago when the previous government agreed the 500 million, uh, but it's only just been signed off and that signature is important because it is a firm commitment. And there were a few interesting things in the announcement today, I thought. One particularly was the new government's commitment to a steel strategy. What might that look like, do you think? Well, I hope a steel strategy brings together the industry, the government, and trade unions to work out now what is that, that, that roadmap for our sector to get us back into posit more positive times. I hope that we can work together in partnership to look at how best to spend the additional money that the government wants to invest in our sector, the £2.5 billion from the National Wealth Fund, yeah. work out where that money can be best spent. Can it be best spent in a, in a plate mill, uh, in a DRI plant? Uh, I don't know the answers to these and I don't think anyone does. So let's not jump to conclusions now uh, and let's not complicate and add to what has happened today. And you just said, Tim, this uh, deal has taken a long time to actually get signed. Well, I'm glad it has, because it's a lot of money. And no one, no taxpayer wants uh, half a billion pound uh, spent on any one company without really good due diligence, a clear plan of where that money's going, why that money is needed, and crucially, understanding exactly, in this case, Tata Steel, exactly what Tata Steel are gonna do with that money. And therefore, what we've seen is this government, this new government, has seen the plan, looked at the details, and today said, yeah, yeah, we want to be part of that and invest half a billion pounds in the steel sector in the UK. Yeah, and I think within Tata Steel, we've said, listen, great that we've got the funding. We're putting in £750 million. Pounds. There's a bright new green future out there. We're going to be fairly busy over the next three years with the electric arc furnace, in addition to the casters and the hot mill and the new pickle line in Portal. But people are already talking about saying, well, if there's more money coming, why can't you build a plate mill or a galvanizing line or a thin slab caster? You know, we've got to get stage one done first, haven't we? You're making a very, very good point. And, and this is what I'm thinking. Why would you today be saying, right, we're going to build an electric arc furnace, a plate mill, as you said, DRI, other things, other things. You wouldn't, and if you did, you'd get it wrong. We have to take all of this in stages. Turning around the fortunes of the steel sector will not happen overnight. Uh, steel is a very difficult sector globally, and in the UK, for years and years, with success, successive government administrations have piled costs onto us that our competitors haven't faced, and we have a government now that wants to address those unilateral costs that we face, uh, and that is step by step. So it is looking at electricity prices as well. It's looking at government procurements. Government yeah. is the single biggest purchaser of steel in the UK, and it only buys 60% of its steel 
that it purchases from us in the UK. Well, let's, let's move that up a bit. It doesn't have to be 100%, but let's work with the government to change the culture so any uh, national infrastructure project immediately says, well, of course the steel will come from the UK unless there's a reason why it shouldn't come from the UK. It's, 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 it's changing the culture. It's working with a, a new government that, that has a different attitude, that fully understands our sector. Uh, and, and that cannot, as you said, Tim, that cannot be done overnight. Now, two and a half billion pounds sounds like a lot of money. There's an increasingly loud narrative since this government has come in to power that the books are worse than they thought, they've got to cut spending, they're not going to invest in some of the big infrastructure projects. How worried are you they might take that two and a half billion and say, do you know what, we've given you a head start on the electric arc furnace, actually we've got better things to spend that money on, now you're on your own. I don't think that's something today with this monumental, uh, momentous announcement that we can be thinking about. The government put it in its manifesto. We're working with the government. I met with the uh, business minister, Sarah Jones, yesterday, and it was a very positive meeting. Uh, there, there was a lot of agreement. But as you said, Tim, before, the agreement is uh, perhaps to have a what we call a, perhaps a steel council or a, 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 a group that is made up of the industry, governments and trade unions uh, to look at what's needed and how to work, work uh, uh, through the plan for the future. Uh, I wouldn't want that to be derailed. Yeah. And I think it is derailed, well, we'd be back to square one, yeah. battling global uh, uh, steel prices, uh, uh, global competitors that have an abundance of steel because they have a massive overcapacity and are looking for somewhere in the world to sell that overcapacity. And, uh, and that would be disastrous to the UK. Yeah. And it is interesting, I was talking to your new boss earlier, Martin Brunnock, who's now chair of UK Steel earlier, and I was saying, you know, a lot of people may say, you know, what's the need for a lobbying group like UK Steel when you've got your money for your electric arc furnace, isn't that job done? But you, you were saying there about, the, there's a huge number of issues where the government can still support the whole of the UK Steel industry. Your job's far from done, isn't it? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, we, as you said, Tim, we, we support the whole of the steel sector and all of the issues that I'm talking about go right across all six steel producers and a number of, well, you know, what we call re-rollers yeah. uh, in, the, in the sector who are members of UK Steel. And so we talked about electricity prices, I've just talked about procurement, but there's also steel safeguards, uh, a trade remedies uh, regime which will end in 2026 and cannot be renewed. And what happens then? Uh, if we don't have any uh, what we call protection in terms of trade remedies for the UK, what will we see? Well, we'll see something like, because we believe Europe will have its own protection through a carbon border adjustment mechanism, which we may not have at the same time, and if that happens and Europe is protected and the UK is exposed, we'll see something like 24 million tonnes of steel, or perhaps even 26 million tonnes of steel, uh, globally is looking now for a place to, to be sold. Yeah. It can't go to Europe anymore. And some of that, even a proportion of that, coming to the UK will flood our market. Yeah. Because we all know that we only make these days something like 5. 9 million tonnes of steel in the UK. UK demand for steel is 7.9 million tonnes. Yeah. So even a small proportion of 25 million tonnes, 26 million yeah. tonnes, whatever it is, will swamp our market, suffocate us, and um, will be assigned to history. Because once you lose the steel plant, once you lose the steel sector, you don't get it back. Yeah, yeah. Now, I know you're a busy man, and you've been on a panel already. This must be one of the most important expositions for you in the year. It's a busy, busy event. What are you looking forward to seeing and hearing in the rest of your time here? Yeah, the, the, the Metals Expo is now in its third year, and as you said, Tim, it's, it's the busiest I've seen it. And I know this is, you know, day one. I think it's probably busy because we had a brilliant panel talking about um, how fantastic uh, the announcement today with Tata Steel and Government is and the transition to electric arc furnace. Everyone wants to hear of those plans from, from you as Tata Steel, but also from, from British Steel. But I'm, I'm, you know, I'm hoping to see so much else. So, you know, there's another panel at the moment. Um, it, it, there's also, it's not just, you know, from my point of view, all I think about is steel production and steel producers. But we have stockists here. We have, um, we have different metals. We have something called aluminium, which to me is a bit lightweight <laughs> in my in my book. Um, so there's loads yeah. going on here. It's a really good event in its yeah. third year now. Yeah, listen, Gareth, thanks for taking time out from your schedule to talk to us today. It is a big day. Post-announcement, hot off the press. Thanks for your insights about the 
continuing role of government in our industry and uh, all power to your elbow as you go forward and try and influence that. So thanks again, Gareth. Great. Cheers. Thank you. So it's the middle of the afternoon on day one of the UK Metals Expo. I've just left the panel discussing uh, the transition from blast furnaces to electric arc furnaces steel steelmaking. Uh, and because of that, I unfortunately missed our next guest, Pam Murrell. Pam, you are the CEO of the Cast Metals uh, Federation, uh, and you were on a panel discussing the Back British Metals Initiative. Uh, can you give us a few insights on that, please? Yes, it's, uh, it's in its infancy, but I think it's really around the recognition of the importance of metals and, and materials now. So what we're doing is we're trying to pull together all the stakeholders in the, in the metal sector and material sector and really um, have a, a dialogue with government about both the importance of these, of these materials and how government policy um, can help to really sort of shift the dial. We've got a huge amount of expertise in the uh, primary and secondary metals in this, ca in this country. A lot of uh, financial institutions, a lot of knowledge on commodities. Uh, and really, I think with, with a bit more impetus and a bit more support, we could really have a win-win in partnership with government and the metal sector um, to really create jobs, create value and a very positive future. I think a lot of the world recently has recognised the value of metals and critical minerals and we really we want to be part of that discussion, we want to be part of the solution um, and, and we're really looking forward to sort of taking this forward, working with government um, as part of a wider industrial strategy to really sort of shift the dial. Absolutely, and, and earlier this afternoon, we, uh, I think it was Johnny Reynolds, stood up in the House of Parliament and announced, and he announced the Labour government is going to give uh, Tata Steel £500 million, similar to the, the Tory um, or deal they were going to announce, uh, £500 million towards our electric arc furnace. So th that is a step in the right direction, do you think? I think it is. I mean, there's obviously been some concern about jobs and things like that, but really, you know, we've we've invested a lot as a country in uh, in our energy sector and having sustainable energy. So really, we can capitalise on that now. And and the switch to electric arc furnaces for steel is just part of that. Um, we're a, we're a net exporter of scrap steel. We need it as an industry. It's a vital part of our raw material supply chain. Um, so I think, you know. That, that, that landscape is changing, but I think it's a recognition of the value, certainly of steel, but obviously there are other metals and there are other materials. And really, we're a, you know, we're a rich economy. We consume a lot of products and we need metal components and other materials to really drive the energy transition, to make the parts we need for electric vehicles, for rail, for, you know, for all sorts of things, all parts for modern life. So I think uh, you know, the recognition of that and the value of that, the investment in that, in the future of the industry is key. These industries are hugely capitally intense. Um, you know, they're, they're expensive bits of kit. And, uh, and the payback can be quite long term. So if government can de-risk some of that for businesses, then we really can have a bright future. But you know, we don't want to lose some of these industries because once they've gone, we'll never get them back. We'll still need the parts, so we'll be buying them in from elsewhere and exporting our valuable resources. Um, you know, our sovereign security, our critical supply chains, once they've gone, they've gone. But actually, it would also be um, exporting our carbon footprint, which is, is morally not correct thing to do. And, you know, really, we've got, we've got the opportunity to do more of what we need in this country to be more sustainable and to do the right thing globally, but also to, to grow the UK economy. And a big step, you touched, touched on it there, is the, the abundance of scrap we have in this yeah. country. And that is very much down to the industrial revolution we had in this country. So we've had over 100 years worth of steel scrap, which is why we're in a position where we, we export more scrap than we actually use. Um, do you think we're on the brink of sort of the green industrial revolution? 
Well, <laughs> it would be nice to think that. I mean, I think there is there is a huge transition going on. I think people are starting to think about their supply chains, starting to think about the materials they, they use uh, and the value of those materials. Um, I mean, certainly globally, we, we certainly you know need a transition. Um, yes, you're right, we are a net exporter for a number of reasons. Um, and I think we'll continue to be a net exporter. But it would be nice if we could um, keep the more valuable stuff the things that we can use here uh, you know and that requires investment in in segregation and making sure we keep the composition and, and the chemistry of the materials the quality materials you know all sorts of materials platinum copper steel it's all sorts of materials that we need um, but I think I think there's a recognition of the value of those um, so yeah maybe we are at the beginning of a green revolution um, I think there's certainly you know metals are just as important as they've ever been we've had an iron you know an iron age and a bronze age and things like that and maybe we're now going to have a new metals and materials era which is built on you know recycling some of those materials and making reuse of them i mean they're virtually permanent materials um, obviously there are some quality issues and some processing that required but they're, they're a pretty permanent materials then they don't need to be um down cycled they can literally be melted and used again and i think that's that's hugely valuable and in our industry, the casting industry, is a big part of that. We're looking forward to working with the steel sector and the recycling sector to really have those conversations and make sure that, you know, there's something for everybody in all of this, but it's a win-win for the UK as much as anything. Yeah, absolutely. I know tomorrow you're on another panel, aren't you? You're on... Um a panel discussing uh, the state of metals or the UK metals industry, is it? Yes, uh, it's, um, it's, uh, I'm, we're part of the UK Metals Council and the UK Metals Council commissioned uh, a piece of work, a survey. It's the second one we've done um, where we go out and we ask uh, our members from the trade associations but also other stakeholders, you know, what, what are their, uh, the challenges and opportunities from the metal sector. So yes, I'm looking forward to discussing that tomorrow. I mean, the, the, the common things, as you would imagine, are, are things like energy, uh, um, raw materials and supply chains but particularly skills as well skills is a big one um, so there's some really interesting uh, discussions to be had there I think we'd really like to see um, a shift you know the industrial strategy is is important but then also a recognition of local uh, local procurement for infrastructure and things like that so that so that that, that report will be a, a sort of a snapshot of, of where we are as an industry and the opportunities that we can hopefully work with government on over the coming years. Okay. Fantastic. Sounds like a, such an insightful session. Really looking forward to hopefully catching that tomorrow. Sorry I couldn't catch uh, today's. But uh, we're going to leave it there for now, I'm afraid. And I'm going to move on and see uh, who else I can grab. So it's day one of the UK Metals Expo 2024 and I'm delighted to be joined by Kirsty davis Chinnock, who is Managing Director of Professional Polishing Services. Kirsty, welcome. Thank you. It's lovely to see Tata Steele here again. Yeah, and I know this is your third year, isn't it, coming to the UK Metals Expo and it's our third year as well. You featured on Steelcast before. So my first question for you really is, in the three years that the UK Metals Expo has been running, how has it grown? How has it developed? I think it's doubled each year in terms of exhibitors. Um, it's great to be in the new hall, Hall 12. It's so much bigger. It, it's just, I, I try to sort of have a quick walk around to see people I know. And I, I walk down an aisle, see somebody and then come back to the stand and I have to find my way back. I keep getting lost. It's great to see it so big. And I think it just shows how important the metal sector is and just how valuable we are to the UK in terms of business and economy. You stole the words out of my mouth, really, because I was going to ask you next, why is it so important to come to events like this? But, you know, as you said, there's so much going on. And I know that you were on a panel this morning about the state of the UK industry, and there was a report following that as well. What were some of the key takeaways from that session then? I think whenever you do a report like this, um, the UK Metals Council will try and pull out one main thing. Um, and, and what they pulled out was the resilience of the metal sector. Um, we, I mean, I've been doing it 35 years. The metal sector in various guises is constantly in the press. 
not always particularly positive things, but it's a positive industry. It has to be resilient. It has to change. And I think the key points from the report that the council has done that we were talking about on the panel, it's the same old issues. It's energy. Well, we all know that. Um, it's skills. Well, we all know that. And it's no different now to when I started 35 years ago, we still had the same issues. And you'd think we'd have got better at addressing them, but apparently not. Um, it's about retention of people as well, rather than just recruiting the skills. A lot of the industry is changing really quickly. Um, so we need to keep up with training and making sure that the team we do have stay with us. Um, so all of that sort of came out. Obviously, some regulatory things as well. I'm going to say the dreaded word, CBAM. <laughs> um, and, and the UK has really lagged behind Europe in that. At the moment, it's obviously uh, Europe isn't actually taking any money. It's just the reporting. But when the UK CBAM hits, that's going to have a cost from day one. That's around the corner. And we also have the US CBAM around the corner. And we're all running to keep up. And it's frustrating that from government we've not had anyone who's going okay industry this is what we need to do let's get a plan and work together we're back to needing an industrial strategy so many key takeaways like you said an industrial strategy is obviously a massive thing but I want to go back to that skills point that you made just there like you said retention is a big thing but I mean how we see it at Tata Steel is you know there's there's a gap you know surely new generations will want to come and join us on this journey we've got a light at the end of the tunnel as we move towards decarbonisation you know the whole UK metals expo sorry sector is on this exciting journey so how do you think that we can sort of work to recruit more diverse skills and talent into the industry we have an opportunity here and I think as a sector we need to turn it on our head I'm guilty of doing it as well you know, it's very easy to say, this is a problem. How do we solve the problem? How do we do this? How do we do that? We've not managed to solve it in 35 years. Let, let's change the narrative. Let's make it an opportunity. And it's going to make us better employers. It's going to bring skills in from people who do things differently. You know, we've got Generation Alpha coming up. They're going to be working in a handful of years. You know, Gen Z is so over, you know, it's Generation Alpha next. And you've still got, you know, people who are running businesses and running departments who are in their 40s, 50s and 60s. And it's very easy to go, this is what we've always done. And it's very easy to go, but we can't go to a four day week because we need to run machines five days a week. And it's very easy to go, we well, can't have half term off because there'll be no one at that desk or at, at that line or at that plant. And I don't know what the answer is, but it's at least considering maybe we need to do things completely differently. And that's, for an SME, that is really painful because we don't have the money, we don't have the personnel to be able to do things like that. But if other companies start doing it, we can sort of learn what works, what doesn't work, what we can put in our businesses and what we can't. And at least we're going to start moving together forward and taking advantage of this opportunity. I love that positive attitude, just flipping, flipping the challenges on their head almost. And that's the sense that I've got from, you know, this whole day at the event, really. Um, but I think there's small steps that we can take. So obviously we're stood in front of this lovely signage of the Women With Metal podcast. And similarly, we've got the Women of Steel podcast in, in Tata Steel. Um, what are the sort of recurring themes that come up in these podcasts as you chat with women across the industry? Are they, do they feel the same as you? Are they echoing the need for change? Not just in terms of a diverse workforce thinking, you know, a balance of male and female, but also people from different ethnic backgrounds, etc. What are these people saying? It's really quite interesting because there are common themes. A lot of the common themes 
bearing in mind I speak to women from all industrial areas, not just the metal sector, is that quite often they're not taken seriously or they really have to be bullish and push their way through. And there's awful lots of mansplaining and man interrupting. And, and there is also an awful lot of great male allies in the sector. And I think one of the things when it comes to diversity is them not feeling alone, them feeling they can be themselves, they can bring their authentic self to work rather than trying to fit into a box and behave the same way that men do. And the podcast that was released this morning uh, is a fantastic woman called Katerina Hayes, who runs a food manufacturing company in Scotland. And she's originally from the Ukraine. Now, one of her parents is from Ukraine and her other parent is from Russia. Um, and she was in the oil and gas industry and she now has a food manufacturer business. And just talking to her about everything that she's gone through, I'm just so grateful that we have entrepreneurs who come to the UK like Katerina because she's bringing so much talent. We need to encourage that. You know, we fell off that step, as it were, with Brexit. We have an opportunity again now to reset our relationships with the EU and the wider world and hold our heads up high again. And that's only going to benefit everybody, including the metal sector. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think I've heard a lot of people say this year and last year, you know, that a more diverse workforce is not only a more productive workforce, but a more profitable workforce as well. So it can only be a good thing. Um, I do have one more question for you, Kirsty. So a recurring theme of last year was collaboration is key. We're like, we're all on the same journey again. We're looking towards the light at the end of the tunnel, which is a greener future. Um, and I've got the sense this year that it, we're very much a community now and we've almost become more close-knit because of this shared and common goal. Um, what, do, what are your thoughts on that? Collaboration has always happened to a degree, but since COVID, it's really stepped up a bit more. It was all like, we can't do this on our own. We need to work together. And I'm really pleased that that's continued as the world has opened up. Um, next month in October, um, there's my second Women With Metal conference in Birmingham. And the collaboration of the people that come to that, we've got fabricators, mills, stockholders, processors, end users. And again, it's all about sitting down, talking and learning together. Last year at the UK Metals Expo, I was talking to one of our key accounts over here. And he said something to me. He said, it's not about coming to the UK Metals Expo to try and win a new order or a new account. It's been in the room with your customers, your partners, your suppliers, your competitors, and having conversations together and looking at how you can collaborate. And as the UK Metals Expo gets bigger, that's, I'm gonna use the word opportunity again, that gives us an opportunity to collaborate with more and more people. Kirsty, that's great. Look, thank you so much for joining the podcast once again, and hopefully we'll speak to you next year. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, there's a lot going on at UK Metals Expo this year. There's a lot of seminars, there's a lot of exhibitors here, and a lot of really in interesting discussions about a huge variety of topics. We just finished one over in the Big Issues Theatre, which is all about UK energy and energy security, but it was quite a wide ranging discussion. And one of the panelists is a, a lady I've wanted to talk to for some months now, to be honest, and I'm delighted she's taken some time out before she disappears to join us. Luciana from Celtic Freeport. Uh, Luciana, everyone's talking about the Celtic Freeport as an important part of the uh, next stage of the development of the South West Wales region with the steel industry reducing in numbers. People are looking to the Freeport to help build back up those numbers. What are your ambitions for the Celtic Freeport? 
Thanks for the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, I think the Celtic Freeport is a great initiative to start with. It's a big partnership between private companies and the public sector, the UK and Welsh government. Uh, and we have like a big ambition. We really want to transform the energy ecosystem uh, into renewable energy, but also green manufacturing. Uh, we do have two amazing ports together with us, yeah. uh, Associated British Ports in Port Talbot, yeah. uh, where you guys are based as yeah. well, and also the Milford Haven Port Authority and the Pembroke Docks yeah. with a lot of energy producers there. So I think we have the right components to A, do a nice energy transition that can involve floating offshore wind, but also hydrogen, ammonia, methanol, sustainable aviation fuel. Wow. Uh, and we also have in the Port Talbot area all the heritage and tradition of yeah. the manufacturing skills, the steel, which hopefully is going to be green very soon yeah. as well, and how we can transform that also with carbon capture mechanisms and bringing more industries to the region to take advantage of the great location, the great port, and as the free port, hopefully we are going to bring in some uh, tax incentives and financial benefits, yeah. both from the companies setting up but also for the innovators in the ecosystem and the skill providers. So you can really make sure that the benefits are then uh, in a just transition and cascaded for the community. Yeah, because people are understandably concerned about the steel industry getting smaller with our transition to electric arc furnace steel making, worried about jobs in the region and the whole wider economy. And I think when they look at the area there, the big area around Port Talbot uh, Harbour, and they hear about the Celtic Freeport, they worry that the people who are going to come in are just going to be call centres, but you're saying it's much more likely to be an extension of it manufacturing industry. Yes, exactly. So I think like when you talk about floating offshore wind, for example, the size of the opportunity is really massive. So we will start at 4.5 gigawatts, but if we are to really complete the whole 16 gigawatts potential, we should be sending a turbine to the sea once a week for the next 15 years. Wow. So that's a big, big challenge for us, one important infrastructure. So for sure, our ports, being that in Port Talbot or Pembrokeshire, they will need a lot of investment and construction work. Yeah. Uh, but also we will need uh, manufacturing capabilities, being that for the turbines themselves, for the blades, for assembly, for uh, the manufacturing, but also the maintenance yeah. uh, for deploying those turbines, the yeah. cabling industry and the whole supply chain. And that's just talking about the floating offshore wind. Yeah. But now we also have onshore wind after the ban was lifted uh, with the new um, Labour government. Mm -hmm. We have hydrogen, sustainable aviation fuel, and all of that is going to need like jobs and skills that are very transferable from the current community yeah. that has been working on uh, a steel industry in Port Talbot. So I think the future is bright. It's a little bit uncertain now, and yeah. it's uncertain for the Freeport in a way as well, yeah. because we need to see how all the pieces of the puzzle come together yeah. in terms of energy transition, but also manufacturing transition. Yeah. But the opportunities are there, the wheel is there, and yeah. I think with some more months, uh, and especially with the announcement today of the deal stricken, uh, struck by uh, the UK government, Welsh government and Tata, I yeah. think there's more certainty coming to the, the area yeah. and I think we are going to be able to provide some more clarity in the next few months. But I think the commitment's there, the will is there and the skills are there, so we are going to be able to use it. And I think that's one of the concerns people have is saying this all sounds great, the story you're telling is fabulous, we can talk about the circular economy, you can talk about the hydrogen corridor along the South Wales network, you know the South Wales industrial cluster have got a great story to tell but they're saying but you know, that's kind of manana, it's tomorrow, it's like when's it going to happen and are there any sort of key milestones that people should be looking out for before we start seeing actual things happening, actual spades in the ground and actual announcements of people investing in that region? Um, I think that's a great question and I think if I knew the answer for that, <laughs> uh, I would be a millionaire by now. Um, so. What I can say is about our milestones as the free port and hopefully like industry will follow. When I talk to industry right now, nine out of 10 people tell me that they don't have enough people for all the jobs that are coming. Yeah. Uh, and that's, those are jobs around manufacturing, but also in, in energy. They're not necessarily all of them just at Port Talbot or just at Pembrokeshire. They're across the chain. So I think that there are opportunities that are already tangible in our region, it's more about matchmaking, 
yeah. the skills that we have and the people that are going to look for a job with the opportunities that already exist. So I think we, it, it's the future has already started. Yeah. We already have great companies operating in the region, both in Port Talbot and in the Pembrokeshire end, but also in between as well, in Swansea and Carmarthen. There are many opportunities already. In terms of the Freeport, the milestone is getting our full business case approved, which are hope, right. hopefully is going to still happen this uh, this year. And once that is done, we will have 25 million pounds in seed capital Great. to really start to enable and unlock the infrastructure yeah. that is needed for those investments to come. Yeah. And with that, it's going to be like lots of jobs coming, mainly around infrastructure, yeah. construction, enabling the grid. Uh, so so th there are particular opportunities that will unlock very quickly, mm. at least until the next year coming. Yeah. Uh, some of them is going to be a little bit more medium to longer term with port infrastructure works going on. The grid is going to be an ongoing project that we need, course, yeah. but also hydrogen pipelines yeah. and making sure that even in, in terms of housing, in terms of transport network, logistics, yeah. there'll be lots of jobs coming in as we start to put those infrastructure projects in place. Yeah. So, so I think they're like the main milestone from my perspective is getting our full business case approved yeah. so we can unlock at least those 25 million pounds of investment. Um, but after that, probably in the next one to three years time, it's going to be a lot of groundwork into the grid, into infrastructure to enable more to come. Yeah. And now you mentioned earlier about our own transition to green steel. It's going to take a few years. How much do you think that will be an incentive for steel using industries to come to the region? I think one of the key aspects is like when you have a supply chain, more investors come and a cluster develops that. Yeah. So the fact that we have not just a very important player like you guys that, that will be producing green steel, but we also in the UK have lots of scrap metal yes. that could create a circular economy. Yeah, yeah. We can also have the carbon capture usage and storage that. It's going to create a cluster around it for the floating offshore wind. It's going to be around the fabricators yeah. and what sort of uh, material they're going to choose to use. But green steel has lots of applications for that, but also for the, the floating structures. Yeah. So I think it's going to be a lot of R&D development in the area to figure out for floating offshore wind, how we can use green steel and what sort of like pieces of the supply chain we can capture locally. But I think honestly, the future is bright. Um, and the fact that we're going to have green steel here and we have the supply chain for the scrap metal, we just need to work with R&D and with the then buyers yep. and producers of the yep. flow supply chain to understand what's the best usage. Yeah. But again, it's about bringing all the expertise of different players to the table. Yeah. So and instead of working job. like in terms of silos, <laughs> it's how do we work together yeah. and yeah. understand from industry, what do they need? And from your expertise, how Green Steel can, can rise up to the challenge. Yeah. Uh, but if we don't talk, then you'll never know. Yeah. So hopefully Freeport can help bringing the right partners to the table to at least have the discussions and if there's money needed for like infrastructure development, innovation and skills development, we are here to help. Yeah, and I know you're a busy lady and I've got to let you go briefly, but you talk about money. Um, I guess my final question before I let you go is, you know, there is the transition board. So yeah. there's 80 million from the government, 20 million from Tata Steel. Is there any way that some of that money can be used to encourage inward investment that could be linked to the Freeport? Yes, for sure. So one of the things uh, it's going to be very interesting to do now that all the announcements has been made is really sit together and see how our plans and the transition plan and the local economic action plan from Port Talbot talk to each other and how we can come together as a group to, to make the right uh, USP for investors to come together and unlock the money. I think one of the mechanisms that is quite interesting for us to consider is about having a, a joint fund. So we can put some money from the Freeport, some money from the government, some money from Tata, and then bring other investors in and create this massive transition fund that is going to be what's going to be the industry of the future and how Port Talbot can play a role in that, bringing the green steel, bringing the Freeport incentives, but also bringing the industries that will need the steel and will need to unlock this investment to really materialize yeah. into tangible opportunities. Yeah. Sounds like you've got your work cut out there, Lucia, and I have to say that sounds like a you know, hugely positive view of the future, uh, hugely aspirational, but you seem very confident that it's all moving in the right direction, it's going to happen, and I think people should take a lot of comfort from that, and um, frankly, all power to your elbow for making it happen, and uh, good luck with it goes forward. Come and see us on the Steelworks site, we'd love to talk to you again, and uh, 
you know, maybe get you on site and talk about the regions and the collaboration between ourselves and partners such as ABP and, and the Freeport. But listen, thanks for taking time out today. Thanks for your session as well today. And uh, we'll catch up soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. So end of the day here at UK Metals Expo, we just had the final seminar in the Big Issues uh, Theatre and it was all about scrap, which is one of the major topics for the steel industry today and going forward. I'm delighted to have grabbed uh, Antonia from uh, the, let me get this right, British Metals Recycling Association. Uh, and I know they're about to shut the door, so we'll try and make this fairly brief. Thanks very much for joining us. So British uh, Tata Steel announced today, signed by the government, that yep. they're going to go down the uh, electric arc furnace route. Or we knew that, but we've got the commitment. Yep. British Steel are talking about doing a similar thing. Demand for scrap is just going to go through the ceiling, isn't it? It's really exciting. Um, I think to have an onshore demand again in the UK is exciting. It's exciting for us. It's exciting for manufacturers to see the re re burgeoning of the re birth of a scrap in, of a steel industry yeah. so I think it's it's a time for celebration and excitement yeah because a lot of the scraps currently exported isn't it uh, a lot more will now be imported is it obvious the price is just going to go up well I don't think it's going to go up I think I think that's a misconception we only export because there's not the current demand yeah you know exporting it is expensive yeah and it's not necessarily what to do we've got to move towards decarbonization so keeping it onshore is really really important yeah and we want to work together to achieve that yeah. so i think you're going to see a change in the way the relationship between the steel mills and the scrap merchants is going to change yeah. there's going to be talk about chemistry working together delivering on what the end product's going to be, rather than just saying, well, here's the scrap, you make whatever you want from it. Yeah, so, that's quite an interesting change, maybe, from the current market structure, where it's a very much a supplier-customer relationship to I a collaborative one. Absolutely, and I think, you know, we have always had the issue about price, and that's natural, because it's a commercial thing. You know, people want cheap, cheap anything. Whatever you do, you're going to haggle. Yeah. So, but now it's, it's actually achieving our goals nationally as well you know there's a there's a sense of pride yeah. to get the steel industry back on its feet yeah. and to fly the flag yeah i've got a feeling you're going to be busy over the next few years antonia and uh, <laughs> you know there's lots of changes coming clearly in the scrap market the whole dynamics are changing and if we look at tata steel you know we currently use half a million tons of scrap a year we're going to go to nil and then we're going to want two million tons that's going to be a tricky transition isn't it i think it's it's about having confidence that the steel demand will come back yeah. which is why we're looking for support from government in terms of the wealth fund to help us transition but also commitment from steel companies to say no we are going to buy from you we're not going to suddenly go to dri yeah. we are going to buy from you so they're having that commitment and you know it's not long it takes time to, to build plants to transition. It can take up to a year or more to get permits. Yeah. So we've got to get packing now. Yeah. And it's really exciting to be part of that, to be part of the academia that's looking at the projects, trying to come up with solutions. Yeah. And it's exciting. It I'm brilliant. really excited. I'm actually looking forward to it. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to seeing the transition away from the old specifications, which I think they, they were good when they were there. Mm. But I think right now moving towards chemistry and being sure of what we're supplying I think that's going to be a teamwork. And does the government have a role to play in this transition or is it an industrial collaboration uh, initiative? I think the government always has a role um, yeah. I said earlier I think and I think my Roger from EMR said in the talk we need maybe some some guarantees of funding from the wealth fund to help us transition as a sector yeah. because it's changing our process a little bit it can be done yeah. but it's expensive so we need help with that commitment so it's 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 all three of us i think yeah. listen as i said earlier you're going to be busy over the next few years i'm sure we'll see more of you thanks ever so much for taking time out to see us no and take, talk to us this afternoon and uh, all power to your elbow for what comes ahead of you thank and you um, i'm sure we'll see you again thank you thank you That's it for this episode of Steelcast, recorded on day one of the UK Metals Expo 2024. Join Tim, Abby and I for the next episode, covering day two, where we dive deeper into the scrap challenge, CBAM and the social implications of the transition to greener steelmaking. Don't forget to subscribe to Tata Steel UK Steelcast on Spotify, Apple or wherever you get your podcasts. If you're watching on YouTube, you can subscribe to our Tata Steel UK channel to be informed whenever we release the next episode and indeed all future content that you won't find anywhere else. 
Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.